Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Police Scotland has unveiled a new aerial drone system to assist them in searches for missing and vulnerable people. After initially denying it, the Nuclear Power Corporation of India has now confirmed that their network of nuclear power plants has been hacked. Amidst an already rocky ship following their response to U.S. sanctions in Venezuela, Adobe continues to falter in the eyes of users, making a security blunder that exposed around 7.5 million user records to the public. And an interesting and unexpected flaw in how smart devices work has turned up as five months after returning a rental car, the customer discovered that he can still track the vehicle, lock and unlock it, and even start and stop its engine. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Police Scotland has unveiled a new aerial drone system to assist them in searches for missing and vulnerable people. The remotely piloted aircraft system, our pass, can see things we can't to try to work out where people are. It uses advanced cameras and neural computer networks to spot someone it's looking for from a speck up to 150 meters away. Its recognition software is compact enough to be run on a phone with the technology learning as it goes. Nicholas White of Police Scotland's Air Support Unit says, quote, The drone itself has very special sensors on it. There's a very highly powered optical camera which allows us to see things quite clearly from a good height. Also, there's a thermal imaging sensor which detects heat, end quote. He also reminds us the, the, reminds the public that this technology is not for invading privacy or spying. Quote, we're there to find people, people who need our help or people who are lost, end quote. Drones are becoming a common sight. Outwardly, this one looks no different from others, apart from a flashing blue light. But the data this drone gathers is processed in real time. The software can discern an animal, person, or vehicle from just a handful of pixels in a huge moving color image. How? Because they taught it to. Professor, Professor Carl Shosky, Dean of the School of Computing, Engineering, and Physical Sciences at UWS, said it could spot someone from up to 150 meters away. He said, quote, it does that by being shown images, multiple images, time after time, until it recognizes what the objects are from pretty much any orientation, end quote. The term artificial intelligence might conjure up images of Terminator-like thinking robots. But in this case, it means a machine that can learn. The team taught it using hundreds of hours of footage of police officers in different clothing positions and situations. And there's another breakthrough. Professor Shosky said, quote, it doesn't require sophisticated supercomputing. It really is quite a low co cost approach to this. It just simply uses a mobile phone, end quote. A search needs two police just two police officers to operate it, one to fly the drone and the other to use the recognition software. Police Scotland has already deployed three of the drones across Scotland and the system's formal launch will come on Thursday in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. This is excellent. Thank you. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I do not this expect is, that enthusiastic wow. response. Wow. This is excellent. This is the first time we've had agreement. I'm like, I'm out of place. I feel like normally <laughs> I'm no like, mediation I'm like the, I have to like stand in the middle here. Yes. No, what this I, is wonderful. What I really Such like about this feeling. is the fact that they used AI to yes. train the, the drone to look for the images, and filter out the rest of the oh. data. You know what I love? That's so cool. Our phones have AI chips in them now. Yes. Yeah. Like our phones, our smartphone, the thing that fits in my pocket has an AI chip. Mm -hmm. I love it because I use it for my camera. My sure. camera has AI mode, and it is astonishing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a Pocophone F1 panoramic photo using the AI mode? Like it is amazing. How is it just the, pieces it is all that the together? One you showed us at your birthday party. Yeah, probably. Oh, yes. oh yes, because we were playing yes. around. Yeah, we're playing around. And I was like, okay, like kids, move. Fifteen yeah. Luke's. Yeah, it was yeah. amazing. My son yeah. was everywhere. He's like, hold on, when you move the camera, let me move to the next. <laughs> so you go around, and all you yes. see is like it's 
Yeah, but the funny. AI pieces it all together yes. and makes it work. It was so it was great. Yeah. Versus the old, you know, cameras gone by where somebody has half of a body and half of a head yeah. and two two legs sticking out of their back and like, yeah, it just didn't make any sense. But the AI like says, okay, well, this is a person, and let's put That's it right. all back yeah. together. But yeah. AI and the chip in the phone can now be used for. Like controlling this kind of technology? Exactly. It's awesome. I also like that it only takes two police officers to use it, which means yes. that they can really do more active searches everywhere, knowing that there's not a huge draw on the police force. Right? Yes. Right. So but also, this is ideal. Not just a huge draw, but yeah. as a police officer, because I obviously am one. No, but as a uh, police in, in the police force, like if your resources were so tapped that, like, you know, you know how any job is, yeah. right? Um, I can't be, I can't go through the, like, the learning process and the training of, like, this big onerous right. system. Right, yeah. but I mean... This thing that requires me to, like, read manuals and manuals and then, like, practice and practice and learn it. Like, they have to make it so easy, if, and easy is a relative term, but right. easy in that, like, the AI does a lot of the work so that they really, like, they just need a quick training they they know how to use it they've practiced with it a little bit and they can use it right it's as easy as that and, but i mean you've got the easy aspect of it i mean obviously it's going to be more than just like we're simplifying yeah yeah of yes. course but sure um but the fact is well like i mean we've had this in our area over many years where somebody will go missing there's tons of farmers field there's tons of forest yes. it's easy for somebody to get lost and you know, and in some cases, it's oh, yeah. led to fatalities. We've heard of and that here. I, I could think of one. There was a teen boy who ran away. They did the oh, grid Jeff. search pattern. Yeah. And then he circled in behind. Yeah. And so they'd already done the search, but he came in behind because he didn't yeah. stay put. Something like this with a drone, where you keep doing the flybys, it's going to go. Oh, hold on, we got him. And but AI oh, can so grab good. it, and, like AI can figure it out. And it say, could be the difference between life and yeah. death. And for that reason, I'm like this. Is amazing. And yeah. to tell you the truth, because the cost now will be so much lower because it's not a huge team of people, it yeah. means that you can extend the search longer, too. That's true, too. Yeah. Two right? people, folks. Two yeah. people to find someone who's lost. Right. It, amazing. It'll, it'll be neat to see if they can advance this to the point where you can, uh, I mean, I'm simplifying it, but kind of like a, a, a dog. You know how that's like, sniff that, oh, yeah. that's what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. It'd be neat if, say, it was a matter of, a certain type of vehicle or a certain item of clothing it's like why not you need yeah. to look for this yeah exactly. like I, I mean we have the the whole uh, amber alert system mm -hmm. and so often like my phone will yeah. go off and it's like oh, this is the vehicle that was used license plate this sure. look for this i mean how cool would it be to be like hey they're heading along this highway corridor get that drone you scan the cars and you go i think that's it that's yeah. kind of like taking this and saying okay let's do that Let's right. do that. Because but, I what, mean, you could see how it could advance with the AI. It, it could be used in this way. Mm -hmm. Sure. What we're talking about right now is the ability to find that lost individual. Like, think about so the, like the Alzheimer's patient who, yes. who yes. walks out of the, the home. Oh, my. Yes. And where are they? Yeah. Like, to be able to find them and help them. Mm -hmm. That's what this technology is about to do. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. It would be interesting to see if they could hone in the skills for densely populated areas. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking, say... Yeah, that's absolutely possible. Like, think Times Square, New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve in New York. Oh, boy. Like, there... Mm -hmm. Tons of Let's people. Let's put it to the test, folks. <laughs> right, but, I mean, how cool would it, would it be yeah. to get to the point where they could continue using imagery to train and go okay filter out this yeah, yeah. this is the image we're looking we're for. getting that's yes. that's somewhere we're getting that's not quite this i, I you're agree. looking at person of interest yes okay that's an amazing idea concept and and that's certainly a technology yeah about that. this is not that this no. is like this and is, rescue. yeah this yeah. is like okay we've lost someone we got to find them quickly before it's too late yes yep. and, and it's scarlet where, where it's the, cold so sure really we need to find them quick yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and that's what this is for yeah mm -hmm. and as sure those technologies are great the person of interest idea that premise of like every camera ai being able to hone in on a person 
that's great, but that's that's more that's more advanced. That falls into like what we were talking about with the Toronto airport, where yeah, they're right. scanning, scanning, they're online. looking yeah. for um, for terrorism, and they're looking for people who are carrying weapons and things like right. that's that's a different thing altogether. It is. This yes, is this is helping those in need, oh, and sure, that's yeah. what this is, great. That's what this is mm-hmm. targeting. And I that, love starting that the news with a good exciting. news story. It's good. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. not, so it's, it's not some sort so of like. So but it is interesting toxic. that we're taking that technology that could be used for yes. those types of like what you're looking leaning toward, yep. and using it for just the the average like hey like a kid who's walked out of their home right on, and the parents are like well, where did they go oh they, by the time they realize that they're out of the house. Like this How happens. How far could they mm-hmm. have gone? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so now they've got a technology that, using AI, can hopefully find that child or that that Alzheimer's patient before it's too late. Mm-hmm. That's what this is about, and that's that's really an exciting use of this technology. And they are stressing that that's what this is for. Mm-hmm. Of course, yep. it's not for spying. It's not for no. violating the privacy that's of right. the residents or anything like that. This is to help those who are in need. Yes, yeah. I'm really happy that you like that good news story. Yeah, now me too, on Jeff. to the next story. Yeah, there's so much agreement around here. This is really weird. <laughs> After initially denying it, the Nuclear Power Corporation of India has now confirmed that their network of nuclear power plants has been hacked. Uh, malware has been found on the administrative network of the Kutikulam nuclear plant power plant. The admission came a day after the company issued a denial that any attack would affect the plant's control system. The breach was first detected on September 4th. Associate Director A.K. Nima stated, quote, the matter was immediately investigated by the India Department of Atomic Energy Specialists. The investigation revealed that the infected PC belonged to a user who was connected to the internet connected to connected network used for administrative purposes. This is isolated from the critical internal network. The networks are being continuously monitored, end quote. It's not clear if data was stolen from the network, but the nuclear power plant was not the only facility reported being compromised. When asked why he called the malware an attack, the malware attack an act of war, threat a- analyst Pukrash Singh a formal, former analyst for India's National Technical Research Organization said, quote, it was because of the second target, which I can't disclose of as of now, end quote. While the attack might not have given direct access to nuclear power, n- nuclear power control networks, it could have been a part of an effort to establish a persistent presence on, nuclear plant, on the nuclear plant networks. As a paper published in May by the International Committee of the Red Cross on the human cost of cyber operations pointed out, quote, the majority of the computer devices in the world are only one or two steps away from a trusted system that a determined attacker could compromise, end quote. The paper points out that, quote, preemptive compromise of trusted systems would make attacks significantly easier, end quote, and that establishing a persistent presence on a network could aid in such things as supply chain attacks, attempts to use software update processes or other potential opportunities to move isolated networks to deliver an attack in the future. While the administrative network of the Nuclear Power Corporation was likely not a good route for such a such an attack given the standards for nuclear control system security, it certainly could provide information about maintenance operations that would be useful for espionage or for a future attempted cyber attack. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So yeah, then there's that. <laughs> <laughs> All this information. Well then. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> It really makes you think, though, about, like, because we've talked about ransomware. Yes. We've talked about infiltrations on networks and people getting hacked because they had remote desktop enabled and things like that. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. but then you think about, okay, well, but my computer, uh, you know, is my computer a key computer? Right. And here is just a perfect example of, well, maybe it's not a key computer, but it has administrator access. Yeah. Yep. Or perhaps in some cases has access to network resources, network shares, and things like that. So if an attacker, an infiltrator, can gain access to just a computer on the network Mm -hmm. of 
the nuclear power authority. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the main computers. No. It has access to those. Yeah. So if they then gain access to this and figure out, hey, what kind of access can we gain based on this? They may not even exploit that. They may just take that to the dark web mm -hmm. and say, guess what I have to the highest bidder. Right. It's scary. It's a sobering thought that that that's a, even a possibility. Like it, it has happened. So yeah. now it's a poss like now it's a possibility that any amount of fallout could happen from this. Right. Well, I mean, I mean it really just potential. opens our eyes. For yeah. Sure. I, I mean, when you're going through the news story, I mean, my initial thought was, oh, no, how deep does this system go as far as, you know, could you overload the reactors or shut them down? Like, mm -hmm. but then it's like, oh, you know, you got the separate components because of the regulations. Then I'm thinking, okay, yeah. but if this is something that is connected to the rest of the, say, external network, not necessarily the internal core, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe it's about a matter of uh, shipments of, I mean, at I don't know nuclear technology. I don't Theoretical. know how it works. Theoretical. Yeah. Maybe it's like, hey, we need to refresh our uranium. We got to get a supply chain in or get some in because it talked yeah. about the supply chain network, yeah. which is logistics. That's purchase here, get it here, do mm -hmm. it there. So maybe it's a matter of, hey, is there a uranium shipment? Oh, let's hijack that truck sure. and yeah. now we're talking about missing uranium. Like, I mean, this yeah. kind of goes hypothetical. Know. Yeah. But, oh, I mean, it, the sky's the limit as far as the external stuff that could be impacting. And, and it just, it comes back to, again, the same deal. You have to think security. And it's not mm -hmm. just on your, your main critical components. It's security on everything. You've got to be smart. And yeah. the thing is, too, that the hacker, and, and along this line, the hackers who are responsible for this infiltration, they're not saying... Let's gain access to this so that we can gain access to that truckload of uranium that's coming in. No, they're no. saying, let's gain access. That's right. Whatever access we can get. Okay, we've got access. What now can, what do we do with what it? What can we do with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got access to, um, to order processing. We've got access to Employee the... files. Oh, who knows what, right? Yeah. Like, it could be any number of things, but... It it's, it's just an entry point. It could lay dormant for years, and they may not know it. You, we know from NASA that they had this dormant Raspberry Pi that was, that was yes. infiltrating their network for who knows how long. Hmm. And, and somebody had just simply installed it on their network, and it gave them access at, through SSH to right. be able to access the network, which means, you know, for those who are familiar with SSH, like Popey, for example, we know that we can create a reverse proxy mm -hmm. into yeah. that SSH device. Yeah. So that means we now have full access to the entire network. Which is scary. It I, certainly can be. I worry that there'll be more to come in this news story for the fact that in the quote the second breach wasn't, like, the, the non-disclosed mm. one Yeah, you know, oh, well, well, there's network. more, but we can't tell exactly. you about that. Yeah. yeah. And That's I mean, that also makes me. you wonder, is this a matter of, ooh, we got in here, Let's get, try this system in this country. Because, I mean, it's not like you're yeah, going to sure. walk into Walmart and be like, oh, yes, I'm going to buy this nuclear security technology software off the shelf. Like, there's not... You can do that in America. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, <laughs> there's not going to be too many producers of software that runs a nuclear power plant. So it's like, okay, we got into this one here because mm. of their lack of security. Now let's try this next let's level. Let's see if this the one is the level, same. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a matter of going around the globe and fishing for those holes until finally you had, you know, the Moby Dick, and it's like, we got our white whale! Mm -hmm. yes. And suddenly... It's true. Yeah. No conspiracy Scary. theory, mm -hmm. but still. Okay, we've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Report and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Now, we're looking at the cryptocurrency report this week. And as the crypto report on Category 5 evolves, please note we now have an official web 
site or web page that you can visit mm. in order to keep up with the crypto report. So if you head over to our website, category5.tv, click on shows, and then you'll see the category5.tv newsroom, and there is a link directly to the crypto report. What that gives you is the like the average information, all the data that we use here on the crypto report in order to give you what is current for cryptocurrency. But you can see that throughout the week. Uh, Keeping so in mind that it's update. always changing. It's uh, a daily update. Oh, okay. So what we do is we create averages for you based on all of the information that we're able to accumulate from uh, various sources online. And so then we take that data, we create averages for you so that it basically kind of makes it a little more accessible. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier to understand. And, and things like being able to see graphs that just make sense to see, hey, where's Bitcoin this yep. week? Where's TurtleCoin this week? It's doing really well, by the way. So Ooh, I can't we're wait basically hear. rich. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I can pay you for those headphones. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of the cryptocurrency report this week. Now, uh, things are fairly static, as a matter of fact. Bitcoin gaining only 123 bucks, so it's sitting at $9,319.80. Okay. So it's pretty static. Uh, Facebook Libra is still not trading. We've got Litecoin at $63.06, up a little bit. Everything's up just a little bit. Uh, Ethereum, also, uh, 184.09. So it's gaining just $0.61 cents per Ethereum coin. It's not bad. Monero up at 62.97, the U.S. dollar equivalent on the coin. Scala, uh, looking at the little micro coins, is at 0 0.32. And as I mentioned, Turtle Coin is a real performer this week. Nice. Yeah, astonishingly sitting now. We're talking about a gain from last week at 0 0.26 ten thousandths of a cent. Yep. To this week, 0 0.43. That's what about a 60 percent jump. Cent. A huge jump for That's Turtle massive. Coin. And if we look at those graphs on category5.tv slash crypto report, you'll see that Turtle Coin this week has gone kind of like this and then whoop. And it's that one coin that's just going up, but it's a micro coin. Yes. So yeah, yeah. we're talking 10 thousandths right. of yeah. a cent. But considering it is a micro coin, it's very easy to mine. It's very easy to purchase or yep. invest in uh, and very affordable. Uh, it's a good way to get in on cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. But because of that, it's, it's, like, it's not worth a lot. Mm -hmm. You have to have a lot of them for it to be worth anything. But seeing that trend and seeing that it is growing very, very quickly, it, it, that's really encouraging for those who are investing in micro coins. Yeah. But keep in mind, the cryptocurrency um, market is always changing. It's always volatile, and it never closes. That means it's open 24-7. That means if you go to bed at 11 o'clock at night and get up at 4 in it's the morning, different. yeah, it's completely yes. flipped on its head. So, like, you've got to keep that in mind. And, and what our recommendation here at Category 5 TV is, is simply to only invest and only um, put into cryptocurrency what you can afford to lose. Because, uh, you know, if you take that approach, if you say, you know, I'm probably going to lose this, then, hey, if you gain, you're, you're just doing great. Exactly. But I don't want you to invest in something that, hey, if you lose, you're really losing. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want you to invest only what you can afford to lose. Yep. Sasha, if we can head back to your newsroom, because I know Certainly. you've got a couple of great stories for us this week. Sure do. Amidst an already rocky ship following their response to U.S. sanctions in Venezuela, Adobe continues to falter in the eyes of users, making a security blunder that exposed around 7.5 million user records to the public. Security researcher Bob Dyashenko, together with Comparatech, discovered the unsecured database. Adobe had left the data of its users on a publicly accessible server. Specifically, the researchers discovered an unsecured Elasticsearch database containing data of Adobe Creative Cloud users. Anyone with access to the internet could easily view the data without requiring any authentication. The unprotected server contained around 7.5 million records of the users. The data included personal information of the individuals, such as email addresses, member ID, country, date of account creation, subscription status, payment status, Adobe products in use, and time since last login. It also leaked information about whether the user is an Adobe employee or not. Despite the explicit personal information it leaked, the unsecured database did not expose any financial data or passwords.
The researchers discovered the unsecured database on October 19, 2019. Upon discovering the database, they immediately notified Adobe about it. Following their report, the company secured the database the same day. However, Dyashenko estimates that the database remained publicly accessible for about a week. It also remains unconfirmed whether anyone else has access to the database during this time. Comparatext report states, quote, the information exposed in this leak could be used against Adobe Creative Cloud users in targeted phishing emails and scams. Fraudsters could pose as Adobe or a related company and trick users into giving up further information, such as passwords, for example, end quote. Users should remain very careful and be overly skeptical if they receive any emails that appear to be from Adobe, especially if it asks for passwords or sensitive data or requires the user to click a link or call a phone number. Okay, so anyone who has the internet yes. has access to 7.5 million user records. Yep. Yes. Anyone who has the internet. Yes. Think about that. For <laughs> That's a really big blunder. That's yes. like anyone. Anybody. Anyone watching this. Yep. Do you remember... Uh, Mission Impossible, I the do. first movie, like dun, everything dun, 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 that Tom dun, dun, Cruise dun, 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 had to dun. go through to get the knock list. I don't know. You're going way back, dude. It's like all the rage. You just watched this, didn't you? No, no, no I haven't oh, watched okay. it in years. But oh, wow. I'm I'm it's listening to this years. story and I'm thinking, have we gotten like relaxed as a society that we're going? Sure. Hey, we got yes. like that sure movie's all about yeah. the super secure knock list and and now you've got it's like hey we got all this information it's just out there yet my grandma could find it i mm -hmm. suspect if there is a are they an employee yes or no column <laughs> i feel like it's from it must be from an employee whoever run that computer is not on the list of somebody put employees. it online yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it's it's unfortunate that this was such a blunder by Adobe because they are a respected name within the industry. I mean, everybody goes, oh, Adobe. I, I, I use Adobe. I know Adobe. I go, oh, Adobe. Right. <laughs> That's it, how Adobe. I like it. But here's the thing. about like I hear the story and I go, if it was, oh, Facebook, I go, oh, come on again. But I hear Adobe. I'm like, really? Adobe? Yeah. Come on. Like, the that's people. the core of who I They're trust. The people who make Flash. I just think I know, just maybe saying. we haven't. I know, but. May, maybe we didn't get relaxed. I think we just have never got to the point where we understand the importance of security. Like, as a general public. Like, it's not that they relax themselves. It's that nobody's ever been as secure as they ought to be. I, I think as a society, we've gotten too relaxed. I think we go, oh, I've got encryption. Oh, I've got, we put too much trust in the software that totes all these wonderful things and we forget about the very basic security. I think, I honestly think that, I mean, and I don't know a lot about Adobe's history, but I, th I think that something like this would lead me to believe that maybe they've never been on the forefront of security. There you go. They're the ones who make Flash. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, but he, so here's the, the, the challenge with this one is you've got all this information that's out there and right at the end of the story, you're like, oh, people, you, you could get these emails trying to get your login information. Mm -hmm. How does Adobe go out there and contact 7 million people? It's not Adobe yeah. that's going to do that. Nah. No, but how do you go out there and go, by the way, uh, you're part of the list. Don't give out your information, but you might want to update it or do some sort of security measures without them going, really? <laughs> really? Are you sure you're not here to sell me duct cleaning? <laughs> really? There's... Uh, to be honest, there's no reason why you should ever be giving that information, ever, anyway. I, I agree. This is just another one of those stories that makes me think, okay, well, hopefully the people that I am in contact with on the daily or love or just general humanity knows that if somebody says, hey, type your password in here, you're not going to listen. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> this really drives us to that mindset of thinking that when we sign up with these companies for their services, we need yeah. to use fake names. We need to yes. use fake account information. Like, because 
keep in mind, okay, so passwords weren't exploited this time. So, but it does go to show that we have to use a different password on every service that we use online. If passwords were exploited, what other services would have been exploited of ours? Oh, because, sure. like, if we use the same password on our online banking and on our Twitter account. And most and, people do. And I a lot to, of people do. Like, oh. Okay, you take care of that. I know. I just this need to do, like, I need, I need a cleanse of it. Yeah. Like, I need, because I've started, but then you get all panicky. And, and, and things like LastPass can help with that because you can do a local dump to like a comma separated value file yes that you can then open into LibreOffice calc or excel or whatever you use and do do a look through and see where you've used the same password over and over again yeah and fix that right go into those services and correct it and yep. then delete your file that you've created mm -hmm. but it really just goes to show that like when you put your information out there we trust that someone like adobe they're big and we can trust them with our data. Like, we're talking about our address, our payment information, our financial information, oh, yeah. and our account information, and, and enough to probably do some, some rudimentary uh, identity theft. <clears throat> Certainly, phishing scams and spear phishing are, are <laughs> yep. big concerns right now because any customer who is exploited, like 7.5 million people here, folks, like, this is not, like, 200 people. This right. is 7.5 million Adobe customers who have been exposed. And you're going to hit some people who are not very tech savvy. And when mm -hmm. those people receive those emails that look exactly like an Adobe email saying, hey, your account has been compromised. Click here to reset your password. And it takes you to add0b3.com. Yep. And lets you enter your password. Now they've got your password. They didn't get it the first time, but they got it now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and now that's the same password that you use on your online banking and your Twitter account and your Facebook account and everything else. And that's where it all starts, right? And once they get your email account, well, then they can find your bank and they can say, forgot password, send me the email. See, and that's why for things like this, I mean, maybe I'm just a little bit over paranoid, but the fact that I have 15 different emails... Like, some people are like, you're nuts, you got 15, but I do. I have Jeff1 at no, gmail.com. But, but I have some emails for certain things. I have some <laughs> emails for others. Okay. Yeah. That way, I don't have those linked systems. Yes. And it's just, it's one more little layer of security. It's like, okay, if I get breached on this email, but I mean, even within those email systems, I also have different password systems, and sure. all of those are individualized. So, can I just save you a lot of trouble and just say, you know what, two factor authentication is the answer, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, I know. So that if your email account got compromised, well, they've got your password. Right, but not everybody does two factor authentication. But they don't have your phone. But Gmail does? G yes, there are so some do services it. that do. Just set it up. I know, but not all services recognize that. I truly wish there was two factor what service does not have two factor authentication and you don't have to say it out loud but if they do not offer two factor authentication move on uh, mm -hmm. there are, so just move on if exactly. your bank doesn't have two factor authentication for online banking oh yeah they're banking wrong mm -hmm. yeah banking, move on yes absolutely. get a different banks, bank they've got it I, I i don't think any of my banks don't have two factor authentication but right. there, there are services that i use and and with an organization that i'm that I volunteer with, they use other services that are pretty specific to what they use. Mm -hmm. And some of those are, you know, you've, you can't get other options out there. It's, it's that software and that service is individualized and they don't offer two factors. So it's like, you can't go somewhere, somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate. Well, that's, that's a huge failing on them. And for those, for those companies who can't offer it, it's don't not, give them I don't real think, info. I don't think don't it's that they can't. Real info. I think it's just that they haven't. But then don't give them real info. Spell your name the other way. Like don't the allow G, it. G-E-O-F-F. <laughs> -E Joffrey. Yeah. Look, yeah. you guys want to say that in your terms of service that I have to give you my home address? Well, you know what? You don't have two-factor authentication, so I'm giving you my postal box. Sure. Period. Yes. Yep. There's no way I'm giving you my home address when you don't even have two-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. Period. That's how we as users have to be. Yes. Right. Because if we're not putting our foot down to protect our data and the confidentiality of 
our lives, then we're as much to blame as the service providers who don't offer those protections. But I think a lot of that is industry mindset. And I, and I think the industry ne needs to get to the standpoint of going, okay, we can't rely upon the public to protect themselves. We have to go that extra level. And okay. I think so often it's, we got to get this out. We got to push it out. We're on a budget. We got to move. We'll deal with this and we'll get to that other stuff later. And mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that's a problem. There yes. are big problems when it comes to budgets. Yes. Absolutely there. We're not even going to go there. Okay. Nope. Where we are going oh, to go. Oh, Sasha wants to move story. on. Oh, okay, <laughs> Sasha. An interesting and unexpected flaw in how smart devices work has turned up as five months after returning a rental car, the customer discovered that he can still track the vehicle, lock and unlock it, and even start and stop its engine. When Masamba Sinclair rented a Ford Expedition from Enterprise Rent-A-Car last May, he was excited to connect it to Ford Pass. The app allows drivers to use their phones to remotely start and stop the engine, lock and unlock the doors, and track the vehicle's precise location. He says, quote, I enjoyed it and logged into Ford Pass to be able to access vehicle features from my phone, such as locking, unlocking, and starting the engine. I liked the idea of it more than I found it useful. The UI does look good and work well, though, end quote. Now Sinclair's opinion of mobile apps and rental cars is decidedly less favorable. That's because five months after he returned the vehicle on May 31st, his app continues to have control over the vehicle. Despite multiple other people renting the SUV in the intervening months, Ford Pass still allows Sinclair to track the location of the vehicle, lock and unlock it, and start or stop its engine. Sinclair has brought the matter to Ford's attention both through its website and multiple times on Twitter. So far, Ford has done nothing to kill his access. He says of the setup, quote, all it took was me downloading the app and entering the VIN and then confirming connectivity through the infotainment system, end quote. While he believes there is probably a way to disassociate his phone from the car itself, he's right in thinking it's crazy to put the onus on renters to have to do that. Not to mention the security questions that that raises. <laughs> I kind of feel like this is like an issue on the car rental companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, so, I feel like they need to have like, like, okay, add to your, like when you're vacuuming out the car when you're cleaning the seats you got to reset the computer right right like that has to be part of the the methodology so what's funny is i i pre-read the stories right okay it, okay so i this morning loaded up the news stories to yeah. pre-read them make sure that i pronounce everything right um and then i check my calendar and i'm like oh yeah my car's getting fixed i have to pick up my rental today <laughs> <laughs> does it have I didn't even, I haven't connected, I haven't even, I just days. picked it up and on the way here, but I am not <laughs> totally going do. to connect hey, it to Hey, if my you phone. rent a Tesla, you can actually control it like a remote control car. With my arm? No, with your app. <laughs> yeah. No. So like totally like see, hey, hey, if you rent a Tesla, let's see what kind I of did, control I you maintain. I, I haven't rented a, a Tesla, but I have rented other vehicles. I mean, just my commuting mm -hmm. job i've had car accidents and so you get it's in the shop you get a rental yep. and i have not yet rented a car that has bluetooth capabilities that doesn't have all of the previous users who have connected data removed Ooh. yeah there, yeah there, there was okay. one that i picked up and I, I chuckled and i went back into the to the dealer and I, or so whatever. you spotted this. You're I, the user. I have you're the renter. Left, I haven't even left the rental lot and I walk in and I'm like, "Do you guys clear the computer?" And mm. he goes, "Uh, what are you talking about?" I'm like, "I want to show you something." There was the previous. Well, I'm assuming the previous eight renters, but there was eight renters Bluetooth information on there, Man. including their gps searches come on it was all in the computer i'm like this is ridiculous man see so that is like definitely oh, a failing so we on cleared the, the information but i mean that's like within the vehicle's database mm -hmm. not even talking about connection remotely and i'm like yeah oh. but, but what's the answer go to the next meeting and be like i've got an idea guys and be like employee <laughs> of the month for sure well yeah <laughs> but what is the answer because like if the car manufacturers start putting like a kill button that like resets everything, then like that's the greatest gag. Like at a party, like just push the kill button on everyone's car. But I feel like if you're gonna buy, like it's you can get you can contact. You said buy. 
There should be. What if I bought a car that somebody previously owned and they start killing my engine on me? Sure. You know how you can put governors on the speed of like NASCAR cars? Sure you can. Okay, so there should be like a But why would you? They're NASCAR. You want them to (laughs) be fast. But they should be able to put like a... A security governor on <laughs> that they okay. that has to stay on if it's a rent rental car. That's smart. right, yeah, okay. and then take yeah. it off if it's a privately owned. And that's mm. where I was going. Is if if you are a fleet based rental company like you know Hertz mm-hmm. or something. Yeah. yeah, it's like oh we're you know Ford we want to buy you know a fleet of twenty vehicles we're going to put it across nationwide outlets mm. that you have it built in to the software right. that there is an automatic hmm. reset. And for a yeah. company like Ford or any other who's got the ability to program, go, hey, you know, we've got this feature. Well, at, it's 50 bucks a car. Don't worry. But it's because of the user data that get you. Okay. This is like, a great feature. Yeah. Gone are the days where there used to be a valet key. You used to have a regular key and a valet key. Right. And ah, the valet yeah. key yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't open the glove compartment or okay. the trunk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They need the equivalent of that for data. Yeah. You Can know? I just say? Yeah. We're having this discussion, and we've had this discussion for all of two minutes and 30 seconds. Yep. And I think we we've, already, <laughs> we've got the answer yep. in that, okay, so, so these big companies that, like Ford, because Ford is the example, yep. why have they not had this discussion for two minutes and 30 seconds to say, okay, let's just say, how long have you been away from your car? Now, yours is in for service, so that's an interesting case. How long have you been away from your car? Right now, since 4.30. Perfect. How long have you been away from your car? Mm, two and a half hours. Okay. How long will you be away from your car? Till a the day? 11th. Two days? So that, what's today? The 6th. So Six. you've got like an, a, you, a week. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's say a week. Yes. So I miss it already. Are you ever away from your car for a week? Vacations. Pretty rare, though, right? So, if I'm away from my car for four days, my phone app disconnects from my car. Unless I approach my car and then it reconnects and it says, you've been away from your car for four days. Enter your PIN. Mm. Yeah. And it shows the PIN on the screen in the car. That makes sense to me. Okay, just to throw that out there. If I'm away from my car for two weeks... It just deactivates the connection altogether. You just have that's to reactivate right. it. Yeah, and that's like later. I mean, like, or at least like let's say, it. let's just say, okay, there's a there, on the screen in the car, it shows a pin, and on my phone, if I have not been at the car physically within the last four days, I have to enter that pin into my phone. It's a four-digit pin. Big See, that's deal. Smart. And that's a little we bit of solved it. That's it. Yeah. We solved it. There you go. Why the heck aren't they doing this? This is what we do here. We fix the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> but that just makes sense. Like yes. that's that's like stupid. Yeah. So Ford, are you watching? Because yeah. come on now. <laughs> just do it and like call it the Cat Five feature or something. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, My car doesn't have Bluetooth though. Yeah. <laughs> Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston.